You're right guys and girls, this is a very unexpected video for you and for me. Um, no, I've just been uh, catching up on YouTube and uh, I've been watching old Jack Hargreaves and he's he, he had a program back in the late 60s up to about the mid 70s, maybe late 70s, um, all about the English slash British country life, how to make walking sticks and such like but you also did quite a bit on old british food and now he actually bred a pig for this video he bred a pig now normally a pig that you would get uh, that would go to the butchers probably between 120 140 pound in weight uh, that's a butchered weight um but he actually did it the old style um fatten this pig up on what they would do in the old days potatoes and kitchen scraps um he got that pig up to 200 pound now when you see this i'm, I'm not going to show you a great deal of the butchery you're not going to see the slaughter or nothing I've, i'm going to cut all that out but you'll see the difference in what the pork looks like then to what it looks like now it's unbelievable the amount of fat as a ratio to the meat is unbelievable. The difference. There's so much fat back in the back in the day. You look at a pork chop now, you get no fat between the skin and the meat. Now the fat, yes, it's bad for you, but it's good for flavour. So you have to weigh it up. Now I think they've gone that little bit too far where they got rid of too much fat so that's cutting down on the flavor so if you're eating a bit of well done pork which my my missus loves i prefer a medium pork but if you're eating a bit of well done pork you could well be eating a bit of well done chicken or you could be eating a bit of well done lamb and it, it just all tastes the same because the fat isn't there to give you the flavor now, years ago, back in the early 70s, I, I was brought up and I was uh, in in Africa, Central Africa. I was in Zambia, Zimbabwe, well, Rhodesia, uh, Northern Rhodesia and Malawi, which was originally Nyasaland. But I, I spent a lot of my school years living in Zomba in Malawi, which is um, used to be the state capital. But we lived about 20, 25 miles from the state capital in, in a little bush village town called Changalumi. And it was, a, it was around a cement factory, Portland Cement. And they had a quarry there and they also had a crushing machine that crushed it all and then sent it to Blantyre, which was a commercial centre of Malawi. Um, but I digress. We used to grow pigs. Just because we couldn't, in, in the rainy season, you couldn't get down the road. So you, if you didn't grow it, you didn't get it. So we used to have a couple of pigs and one was for slaughter. The other one was fattening up. And it, we would just keep it going like that. Um, and we used to have a Catholic priest that, that uh, was based in Namitembo, which was at the bottom of the, the hill. We were on the we were on a on a really steep hill on on the side of Zomba Plateau basically, and Nabi Tembo was right at the bottom, and he used, the, the Father John Bailey used to come up with his uh, handy rifle, and he used to put a bolt through the pig's head, and that was it. I can remember. I mean, when I was at primary school, only I would have only been five, six, seven year old running around with buckets of blood. Um, that's why I made black pudding now, because I'm so used to it. And I love the taste of homemade black pudding. But I can remember doing that. And I can remember my mother sharpening her knives and cutting into the pork. And then my dad coming home work, coming home from work early, so he could carry the joints backwards and forwards to the fridge and to the freezer, etc. Um, and it was a, a whole day. And 
Jack Hargreaves that I've just been watching, now he he came out with a quote, and it's it's true. Um, the only thing you don't use on a pig is the squeak. But then he said he was talking to a farmer about this, this quote, and the farmer said, no, I think you're wrong there. He says, we actually do sell the squeak. We sell it to Austin motor cars for their brakes. <laughs> and if you've ever had an Austin, which I think quite a lot of old British people have, you can understand that quote. Yes, Austin brakes did squeak. And it was from the pigs. The farmers are responsible for that squeak. Anyway, I've downloaded the video. I'm going to upload some of it onto this video just to let you see how it used to be and just have a look at how much fat is on that meat. And this is the way it used to be done. Why it's not done now, I don't know. Health, etc. But anyway, hope you enjoy. Cheers, dudes. Now then, I wonder if you know what kind of a mustard spoon that is. Well, the real point about it is it's a mustard spoon that costs nothing. It's a pig's bone, actually. The pig's fibula from the lower leg. And the first thing that comes out of that is the lard, the fat. This was used for absolutely everything in the kitchen in the days before cooking fats or cooking oils. There are many people today, old wives who know their stuff, who will say they'd still rather make their pastry with lard, pig lard, because that's what gives it a, a real taste. Incidentally, we're taking the kidney out with this from this side. Kept the kidney from this side of the pig. And what my mother used to do was take a great big onion, cut it nearly through so it would hinge open, take the middle out, put that kidney inside the onion, close it with a skewer, and then roast it in the oven, and I can tell you that that was quite something for high tea in the old days. And now, incidentally, you can cut these longer and the uh, belly narrower, if you like, so you can end up with long rib chops or short rib chops or a wide belly or a narrow belly. The first two he's taking off are two joints of loin of pork. And those, he scores the skin for the crackling, and he not only scores it long ways, but you'll notice he also scores it across, <coughs> which gives you short crackling, which cooks better and eats easier. And there are your joints of belly of pork. It's a, you've got a choice, of course, as to how much of the ribs you use for pork chops and how much you use for pork loin. <coughs> and these are fairly short chops. You see, you can have longer ones than that. Lovely lot of fat on them with our big pig like we've got. certainly looking to set forward to some of those. Now, if you notice, he said a nice big pig, but that wasn't a nice big pig. That was an average pig. You go back to the 1920s, 1930s, or previous to that, a nice pig was 200 pound in weight because it had the fat. 
But you go back even further, and there's records of two hundred and seventy pound. There was one at two hundred and ninety pound of pig, and that was slaughtered weight. That was without the the innards. That was a butchered weight, two hundred and ninety pound. So nowadays, yes, you can see why the butchers are charging a lot more because they're not getting half as much meat on a carcass of pork of what they used to. But it all swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Yes, you're getting lots of meat, but you're losing on the flavour. So just remember, flavour. That's why I always go, if I can, to a, a butcher slash slaughterhouse, which we have one in uh, in Sedgefield uh, called Bolums, and they they have some fantastic pork. The beef, mm, I wouldn't like to say, but their pork is amazing, and their bacon is amazing, and their gammon's amazing, because they're using good fatty pork. That's it. I'll let you enjoy the rest of the video. Cheers. I'm certainly looking to set forward to some of those. And now we're giving the fore end back again <coughs> when he's cleared up his trimmings. This was what became the fore ham on the curing side. It's now <coughs> called the fore end. And it's got the long front ribs in it. So the first thing he does, does is to take out the long front ribs. And that is what Chinese restaurants call spare ribs. Except that they serve you the spare ribs, which are just the bone with a tiny little bit of flesh on it, which you have to suck off if you can. Whereas we keeping me in touch with what's going on, we take the blade bone out, the shoulder blade bone out like that, and then that becomes a roast of spare ribs. So there's a heck of a lot of difference between the spare ribs. Now this joint we used to make into <coughs> what they known as collar bacon and it was literally in salt, salt in the bottom of the plastic container, put your collar in it, cover it with salt, bit of juniper, bit of black pepper, not crushed up mine, whole, and then we would leave it there and we would turn it every two or three days and it would be in that for anywhere between 10 and 15 days. Just You would be able to tell by how firm it was, whether how well it did, it was cured. Then we would rinse it under a tap, wrap it in muslin cloth from the pound shop in Limby, and then we would hang it up outside. Muslin cloth basically to keep the flies off it. But... And the African sun would dry it out, lovely. It would go in the fridge. Breakfast in the morning, bacon butty. Slice it off as you needed it. And our um, house cook called Whiskey, yes, Whiskey, he would slice it off as we needed it. Because it was always better to keep it as a whole rather than slice it and then wrap it just because it would deteriorate a lot less than sliced up. And that was it. That was collar bacon that you've just seen him. Uh, and we would make bacon out of the loin. We wouldn't do it with the, like the chops, as as they, uh, they're talking about it on there. We we wouldn't use that. That, that was a, a, a class act. We would eat that as a as a roast or as a as chops, but we'd do the belly, 
you do the shoulder and you would do the the back half just before the ham turn that into bacon <laughs> you can't complain but anyway crack on Hello. Now then, I wonder if you know what kind of a mustard spoon that is. Well, the real point about it is it's a mustard spoon that costs nothing. It's a pig's bone, actually, the pig's fibula from the lower leg. But the fact of the matter is it, we got it for nothing. That's why people had them, because in the lower levels of country life when I was young, anything that could be got from nothing made life easier. For instance, I made that landing net to go fishing with when I was a nipper. It's as good as most landing nets nowadays. I think, but it was made from a fork from a spindle bush, the comparatively uncommon spindle tree from which the spindles, the spinning wheels were made. And the important thing about it is it has an open fork, no twig in the middle to interfere. So it makes a good net fork. And then this was cane, which was s boiled until it would bend round and whipped in. And the net was made with a netting needle from the what remained on a spool of thread in the uh, the saddlers. So I had to make that because I didn't have any money to buy one. Poor little fellow. Well, as a matter of fact, I thought I was living the life of Riley. Last year, a man in America said something which made me think about my childhood. He was a black man, soldier, and he'd become a general of the army, the highest rank of the general army, equal to a field marshal. And there were only four or five of them, and no black man had ever done it before. And he was interviewed, and he wanted to talk about soldiering, but all the press wanted to talk to him about was the fact that he'd been born long before, before the campaign of Martin Luther King in a very poor share-cropping village in the South. And in the end, one of them said to him, you must have been very poor indeed when you were young. And he thought for a minute, and he said, I guess you're right, but the fact is we were so busy enjoying ourselves, we never noticed it. And I, <laughs> that, that came home to me actually. But then, as I say, we did have to get things for nothing. For instance, this belonged to another little lad who died as an old man two years ago and he gave it to me. And it's a foghorn. Because this boy was born down on the coast and by the time he was ten year old he had to take his place in the family offshore fishing boat and his first job uh, was to kneel in the bottom of the boat and blow the foghorn when there was a fog, so they had to have a fog horn, and they went to the slaughterhouse and they got a cow's horn and then they took a piece of fencing wire and bent it round to approximately the right curve like that, heated it in the fire until it was red hot, pushed it through in order to complete the passage through the horn and actually he could make a splendid noise with this right up to old age. Well, I can't make any noise with it, but he could, and it was a highly efficient, entirely f uh, free foghorn. It wasn't so bad, of course, for us, because we were small farmers, small holders. We had at least some resources, but for the actual working farmhands in those days, it really was very tough. They were very poor indeed. I was told that when I was first born, the wages of a farmhand were 14 shillings a week. I don't know if that's right, but if it is, if you multiply it by 100 now, it still comes to below the poverty line. I do remember that when I first actually knew their wages, they were 27 shillings a week. And they lived, they worked six days a week. And then apart from going to church on Sunday, they dug their kitchen gardens because they lived off their kitchen gardens very largely. They practically never ate butcher's meat, for instance. If you look at the English language, you'll see that when an animal is alive, farm animal, it's cow or ox, pig, chicken, sheep, but as soon as it's dead, 
the name turns into Norman French. So it's beef, mutton, pork, and so on. Which makes it quite clear, it's no accident that, makes it quite clear who looked after the animals and who ate them. And in fact, they were very short of protein. And it was the hunt for protein, of course, which was responsible for all the poaching. Uh, there weren't many pheasants about when I was young, but a hare, if you could get a hare, that was a big meal for a, a family, and it was very well worth the risk. However, there were two animals which they could keep just uh, in their confined spaces, the pig and the chicken. They kept a, a lot of chickens. They used to get a bit of corn from gleaning, uh, but in the main, the chickens got their own living from around the hedges, insects and seeds. A lot of them in those circumstances were taken by the fox and the pig. You could feed largely on potatoes. They grew as many potatoes as they could and uh, household waste and so on. So the pig and the chicken were the two animals on which they depended uh, for legitimate protein. And that is why the English national dish is bacon and eggs to this day. They fed the pig, this one pig, as big as they could. Uh, nowadays, a pig is about 100, 120 pounds perhaps at the most when it comes into the butchers. In those days, we used to try and produce a 10 score pig, which is 200 pounds. And uh, when he was ready, the man who killed the pig arrived and he led him from the sty up the garden path to the house to be killed which means that when you're being led up the garden path, you're on the way to have your throat cut, if you want to remember that. He was killed and then he was bled. And then they put, laid straw on the ground, laid the pig on top of it, and put more straw on top and set fire to it. And that burned all the bristles off him, you see. And they do say, and I think it's probably right, that this gave a flavor to the crackling, which you don't get nowadays, where the pig is scalded and then shaved. And then he came into the kitchen, onto the kitchen table, and before he came, he was cut into two sides, a pork side and a curing side, because we got all sorts of pig meat from one pig. Nowadays, they have different pigs for this job. They have Wiltshire sides for bacon and different sized pigs for the pork. But in a few minutes, I'll show you just how we did it in the old days. You're not allowed to kill a pig at home nowadays, so after we managed to feed a pig up to 185 pounds, a good saddle pack pig, we got Big Jim, our butcher, to take it to the slaughterhouse and then bring it round to his shop to reproduce what used to happen in the home. Actually, nowadays, it's pretty difficult to grow a pig in uh, a sty uh, as a result of all the regulations. As I said, the first thing that's gonna happen is that he's divided into two sides, but there is one thing before that, which is that its head, his head comes off. And now, when he takes the head off, you'll be able to see the famous old boar's head, which was the favorite centerpiece of a big dinner in the old days. That's it, boar's head. Many a pub named after that dish. And as many of you will know, it was customary when you roasted that for the table to put an apple in his mouth. It wasn't always used for that. Most of the time what you did was to take the two jaws off to make bath chaps. There they are, the bath chaps. And when they were off, the rest of the pig went into brawn. Of course, which was delicious. There's the pig. As I say, he's uh, uh, scalded and uh, and shaved nowadays. He isn't burnt as he is in the old days. And now the knife goes into the chine in order to cut. The chine bone is what a butcher calls uh, the backbone. And the interesting thing about this is that Jim will tell you, as any experienced real butcher will tell you, that he can tell the quality of this pig and how it's going to eat this pork and thing as soon as he puts the knife into the bone. Because if the bone cuts easily and freely, 
it means the pig was not killed under stress. Whereas if it has a terrible journey and too much excitement and so on, and it's killed under stress, then that bone will crack and s refuse the knife or the chopper. So it's just extraordinary what skilled people know at any job. But he can tell you by now, as he puts that chopper in, that, that whether this pig is going to eat well or not. And in fact, he declared himself satisfied. He should do, because he was the one who organized it to me. So there we are, the two sides of a pig. One is going to be a pork side, and the other is going to be the curing side. In, because, as I say, we're doing this the old way that was done when it was a family pig providing family food. So that we'll start with the curing side. All of this is going to be cured, except, of course, these have to come off. These are what they call the trotters in the south of England, what we call pig feet, where I come from. Delicious, cold with vinegar. And now he takes off the four ham. That is to say, the shoulder end of the pig. Knife through the flesh, saw through the bone. We'll take that off him for a moment and we'll hand it back to him in a minute. And this is the gammon ham. This is the ham, the shape of which everybody knows, which home cured is absolutely delicious. Incidentally, I forgot the tail. That goes in the brawn. So everybody recognizes that. That's the ham. And that will be cured, which leaves us with the middle of the pig. And the first thing that comes out of that is the lard, the fat. This was used for absolutely everything in the kitchen in the days before cooking fats or cooking oils. There are many people today, old wives who know their stuff, who will say they'd still rather make their pastry with lard, pig lard, because that's what gives it a, a real taste. Incidentally, we're taking the kidney out with this from this side. Kept the kidney from this side of the pig. And what my mother used to do is take a great big onion, cut it nearly through so it would hinge open, take the middle out, put that kidney inside the onion, close it with a skewer, and then roast it in the oven. And I can tell you that that was quite something for high tea in the old days. And now, the one muscle that's inside the ribs. This is the finest piece of the pig, the pork tenderloin. It's uh, equivalent to fillet steak in a, in, a, in a bullock, and that's the bit that Dad always got. And now out comes the half of the chine bone, which remains in this side. You want to try this game yourself, and then you realize how skillful a real butcher is, knowing exactly where to put his knife at every moment. He's a skilled anatomist, no less. And that is the part will be cured for bacon. Now we'll have the Forehand back. Now the forehand doesn't have the shape of uh, of the gammon ham, classical shape of the gammon ham, and so what we did with that after it was made ready, more bone coming out, you see. What we did with that was to bone it all together and then fold it round into a shape and sew it in cheesecloth. That's a, no, a lot of hams nowadays are put in a can, so to speak, having been treated like that. So 
parts. So there is the curing side of the pig. And now we start on the fresh meat side, the pork side of the pig. And once again, the four ham comes off, except in this case, it's called the four end, because it isn't going to be made into a ham. Once again, the foreleg and shoulder comes off. All those trimmings that he's taking off, incidentally, will end up in sausages. And that is a leg of pork. And we actually did used to roast legs of pork of that size in the old days, because time seven or eight people had had three days food off it. It was the Now we're in the middle of the pig again, and once again, we are taking out the lard. And incidentally, Jim is one of the butchers I know who still process this lard, render this lard, and he sells it to the housewives of the district, the one who still prefer to have the lard for their cooking. Now we come to the middle again, and this time we separate the belly. And that's belly of pork. And left in it, when he sawed through it, are the tag ends of the ribs, the bottom ends of the ribs. They come out. Incidentally, we take a little bit of this fat and mix it with the blood of the pig when we bled it, and that's how we make black pudding. So he's taking these rib ends out of the belly. more trimmings for the sausage machine. And what we've got here now will be one, two or three joints of belly of pork. Absolutely delicious. I think almost my favorite. You can, you can cut this into joints of different lengths or you can even rasher it and put it under the grill. But in the old days that also might have gone for curing because the belly of pork could be salted, which is the other way of curing things. And salt pork was one of the ways of getting through the winter in the days before fridges. And in fact, it was barrels of salt pork that took the British Navy around the world in the days of the, the uh, sailing ships. Now we've got the upper end of the ribs. Incidentally, you can cut these longer and the uh, belly narrower, if you like, so you can end up with long rib chops or short rib chops or a wide belly or a narrow belly. The first two he's taking off are two joints of loin of pork. And those he scores the skin for the crackling and he not only scores it long ways but you'll notice he also scores it across. <coughs> which gives you short crackling, which cooks better and eats easier. And there are your joints of belly of pork. It's a, you've got a choice, of course, as to how much of the ribs you use for pork chops and how much you use for pork loin. <coughs> and these are fairly short chops. You see, you can have longer ones than that. Lovely lot of fat on them. Without, big pig like we've got. I'm certainly looking to set forward to some of those. And now we're giving the fore end back again <coughs> when he's cleared up his trimmings. This was what became the fore ham on the curing side. It's now <coughs> called the fore end. And it's got the long front ribs in it. 
So the first thing he did, does is to take out the long front ribs. And that is what Chinese restaurants call spare ribs. Except that they serve you the spare ribs, which are just the bone with a tiny little bit of flesh on it, which you have to suck off if you can. Whereas we keeping me in touch with what's going on. We take the blade bone out, the shoulder blade bone out like that, and then that becomes a roast of spare ribs. So there's a heck of a lot of difference between the spare ribs as we knew it at home in the old days, and spare ribs as you meet them in the Chinese restaurant. Once again, the crackling is scored and it'll, and it'll taste very good, though not like the crackling did in the days when the pig was burned in straw. A spare rib roast, you see, tied at various places, which means you can cut it into one or two or even perhaps three small joints. What the French call a roulade. For the purposes of this exercise and for my freezer, we'll make it into two nice big joints of spare rib roast. And there's the lungs and the lights and everything that came out of him when he was cleaned. Right, the lungs and light. Yes, this is where we're going to. They're, they're lovely, honest, pan fried, slice the lungs very thin, very thin, coat them in batter, pan fry them literally in 10 seconds, that's all they need, otherwise they get very, very tough, like leather, but pan fry them, oh, they're lovely, bit of pickle by the side of them, yep. That's the lungs. The lights. They they the um like the lymph nodes and this, that and the other. Lovely jubbly. I wouldn't personally cook them and eat them as is, but when you're making a pork stew or you're doing a a braised ribs, put the lights Put them in. Add flavour, flavour, flavour. If you haven't got use for them now, freeze them. Take them straight out of the freezer, into the bottom of the pan, put your, your ribs on top. They're going to cook and they're going to make flavour. Yes, they are. Um, liver, obviously. Liver one of the best cuts i love a bit of pig liver just pan fry it like a steak dip it in flour first though uh, it just helps it seal serve it medium rare i wouldn't do it rare but medium rare or oh, my wife likes to say well done i'm not eating it but apart from that, yeah, that's fine. Um, your next bit is your heart. Now, you can do three different things with that. You can slice it quite chunky and then braise it. A bit, bit like a braised beef steak. Braise it in the oven a couple of hours. Or you can slice it quite thin and just fry it, eat it there and then. 
or you can boil it. There's an old, old recipe where you would boil a pig's heart for a good three, four hours. So it was really tender. Then you would open it out a bit, fill it with onions, leeks, carrots, etc. And then wrap the whole thing in suet pastry. Put it in a muslin cloth and then steam it for another four hours. That's eight hours. But if you're a farmer that's going out to work, to work on his land at six in the morning, you're going to make sure that everybody else is up. So those eight hours doesn't sound a long time. If you've got a fire burning anyway in your kitchen to keep the house warm, so farmer would go to work six half six in the morning he would come back in at eight nine o'clock at night pig's heart stuffed oh beautiful you can't beat it so that's what we're talking about everything that came out of him when he was cleaned and those are made into faggots. And this is the piece of the inside, actually the peritoneum, the lining of the rib cage or stomach blade, which is used for wrapping the faggots in. And this is his guts, and the lining of his guts comes out to make sausage skins, and the muscle of his guts, which is these, all very nicely cleaned and thing will be cooked for a dish which is very difficult to get hold of nowadays except from people like Jim but which I think cold and even made in sandwiches is one of the most delicious dishes there are and that is the chitterlings. Gosh I can hardly wait to get at that. That's what we ended up in. Of course, we all cooked pigs at different, killed pigs at different times so the fresh joints could be shared out from each one. I forgot that also we got for nothing our mustard spoon. They said that every sort of piece of the pig was used except the squeak. And when I quoted that to Jim, he said, you're out of date, mate. We sell the squeak to Leyland for their breaks. Ha ha. <laughs> English folk joke of the 1980s. However, that is the main animal from which the poor people when I was young got their protein. Cheerio. Here's me just showing you how to, uh, how I do my bacon and I do it every six weeks and by the time I've finished in six weeks I've got another batch on the go so we're looking well and that's brown sugar, bit of peppercorn, bit of white sugar same amount of salt, make sure you cover everything and that's it. Every two days I literally just turn it over, uh, don't bother getting rid of the liquid that's 
produced just turn it over in the in the liquid because there'll be quite a bit of liquid in the bottom of it and just turn it over you want to do that for eight days depending on how thick your your belly pork is now i normally do it for eight days and then take it out hang it up in some muslin cloth in some heat and dry it out there you've got perfect and i mean perfect bacon now what i'm looking at is one kilo of brown sugar one kilo of salt and spices that's it cheers